This week on Wealth Track, what does visionary Yale economist Robert Schiller, who predicted the bursting of the tech and housing bubbles, think about stock and home prices now? And why does the author of Irrational Exuberance think bonds are dangerous? Answers from Robert Schiller are next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally, and Wintergreen, your home for global value. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Never look a gift horse in the mouth, or in this case, don't fight the Fed. It is a rare occasion in life that investors are given any degree of certainty for an extended period of time. But such has been the case since late 2008, when the Federal Reserve lowered its key short-term interest rate, the federal funds rate, to a record low. Since then, the Fed has reiterated over and over again that it intends to keep short-term interest rates exceptionally low at zero to one quarter of a percent, at least as long as the unemployment rate remains above six and a half percent and inflation is projected to be no more than a half percentage point above the Fed's two percent longer run goal. The Fed is also continuing its program of buying mortgage-backed securities at a pace of $40 billion a month and longer-term Treasury securities at a pace of $45 billion a month to keep long-term interest rates from rising. As top-ranked economic research firm ISI Group told clients recently, Fed policy is probably now the most stimulative it's been in this cycle, and the stimulus is becoming more potent because it is operating on a much improved economy. How much has the economy improved? We'll just look at what's happening in the housing market. After plummeting from their recent peaks in 2005, housing starts and permits to build homes have taken off in recent months. The widely followed S&P Case-Shiller U.S. National Home Price Index rose 7.3% last year. Then there's the sluggish job market. While still high, the nation's unemployment rate has fallen from 10% in October of 2009 to well below 8% now. And meanwhile, the stock market has more than doubled from its March 2009 lows, setting new records along the way. Well, our guest this week is financial thought leader Robert Schiller, and few are more qualified to assess the values to be found or not found in the stock and housing markets. Schiller is the Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale University and Professor of Finance at the Yale School of Management. His finance course is available on Open Yale Courses, and we will have a link to it on our website. But he is renowned on several other fronts as well. An expert on behavioral finance and market risk, he is author of numerous books, including his most recent, Finance in a Good Society, and two editions of Irrational Exuberance, the first published in 2000, Warning of the Tech Bubble, and the second published in 2005, Raising the Alarm about the Housing Bubble. Schiller is a financial innovator. He is the co-creator of the widely followed S&P 500 Case-Shiller Home Price Indices. He is also the creator of the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio, better known as CAPE. Many investment pros believe it is a far more accurate gauge of the stock market's value than the traditional price earnings ratio. Last year, Schiller and Barclays joined forces and launched a family of CAPE indexes designed to offer investors stock market exposure with a value focus. I began the interview by asking Schiller to assess the stock market's current value. A lot of people emphasize that it's set new records lately, but if you correct for inflation, it isn't even close to a new record. So there's so many different ways to describe the market. What I like to do is look at the price relative to some measure of fundamental value. And I have my own uh, method of doing that. Uh, well, I worked it out with Professor Campbell at Harvard years ago. It's price divided by 10-year average earnings, right. which I think is, a, for various reasons, is a more sensible definition of value. And why is that? Well, you want to look at it relative to fundamental value. I mean, if earnings have gone up a lot, then you naturally would think that the stock market should go up too. Uh, but of course, if earnings go up very quickly, 
then maybe you don't believe that. You, you want to take a longer average of earnings. And Campbell and I found that uh, when the price does get high relative to 10-year average earnings, the market tends to go down afterwards. So is it high now relative to 10-year average earnings? It's somewhat high, but it's not super high. So the CAPE ratio, right. uh, that stands for cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio, which I've just described, is at 23 now for the Standard & Poor 500, which puts it high. Because the average is 15? About 15, yeah, right. for the last century. That's high, but it's not super high. In uh, March of 2000, it got up to 46. It's twice as high as it is now. And then, of course, we know what happened after that. The, the stock market uh, ever since has not produced any money in the 13 years since then. Right now, even on a total return basis, inflation corrected. It's down below the peak of 2000. So it's a bad sign when it gets really high. Well, it is somewhat high now, and so that's a bit of a bad sign, but it's not a horrible sign. You just mentioned uh, earnings growth, and you're concerned that the earnings growth that we've seen in the last five, what, five years yeah. has been pretty extraordinary historically. And, and so therefore, that don't expect earnings to continue to go at, at the right. pace they have, right? In the aftermath of the financial crisis, there were a lot of changes. So 2009 was a horrible year for earnings. And then there was this amazing rebound. Now, it's this complicated reason. One of them is that companies have gone on a cost-cutting uh, vendetta. I mean, they, right. were, they were determined to get those profits back. And so that zooms profits up for a while. But cost-cutting can have long-term consequences that will bring it back down. So I've learned to mistrust any sudden surge in earnings. But the market seems to overreact. And that's what we've just seen happen, I believe. So let's talk about the market overreacting because one of the things that you've written a tremendous amount about you know, speculation and speculative bubbles, and you've also studied investor behavior. So talk to me about the fact that investors who have been shunning the stock market are suddenly rediscovering it after it's doubled from its you know, March 2009 lows. Well, I think they're looking at earnings. Earnings are up a lot, and that substantially is driving the market. They're just not thinking... Uh, the kind of long-term thinking that I would advocate, they're not thinking, well, when they shoot up suddenly like this, don't trust it. That's a thing that, that's missing, uh, that people are taking kind of a short-term focus with these valuations. But you know, once again, I have to say, they're not extremely high. It's not like people are making a historic big mistake. It's not like 1929. I hope. <laughs> or 2000 hope in the, but the I don't, tech market. Uh -huh. or it's not like 2000 in terms of valuations. But uh, yeah, there is a, the market has come back somewhat, and people are, uh, I think maybe they're tired of worrying. They, they sense the recovery is underway, and so when they see earnings up, they're, they're starting to come back into the market. And, uh, so good idea, bad idea, neutral on it? It depends on where you were before. If you have all of your saving in the stock market, I think that's a mistake. Uh, but some people had nothing in the stock market. So I think even today, if you have nothing in the stock market, it, it's a no-brainer. You should put something into it, even though it's gotten somewhat high, because it can go a lot higher. That's one thing we've learned. And even though, uh, historically, even though we're in a kind of an economic slump, that's no reason why the stock market can't keep going up. Now, I'm not saying that I know what it will do one way or the other, but I think it would make sense to have some exposure to the stock market, exactly what depends on your personal circumstances. Yep. You describe yourself as a lifelong value investor, and, and looking at the CAPE ratio that we just talked about, yeah. um, there are, where are you seeing value now in the stock market? What sectors in particular? Well, the, the sectors that are most undervalued right now are financial. I'll miss that one for that. That is the bottom. The, the CAPE ratio there is only 14. So it's below average by uh, historical standards. And then you have healthcare, industrials, and energy, which would, they're all below average CAPEs right now. So, as a long term value investor, you've actually identified some sectors and, and those among them. Um, that if, if you have a low CAPE ratio, this, this you know, low cyclically right. adjusted price earnings ratio, 
um, that in fact those sectors outperform over the long term? Yeah, you can't say what they'll do in the next six months, the next year, even the next, you can't be sure about anything. Right. But historically, I, I have a, a research study with my student uh, that takes these ratios back to the 1880s. That's a long time. <laughs> and we find that it seems to have worked. This is just value investing of a different form. And I think that looking at this value measure would augment other kinds of value investing. So the low CAPE ratio sectors, uh, and, and, are, and they're the same as they have been traditionally, the, the four that you just mentioned, for oh, it instance? Moves, it moves around from year to right. year. But right now, but the lowest point, CAPE sectors are what you just said, the and, financials, And the healthcare. lowest of them all is financials. And I think that that is kind of an overreaction to this crisis that this was a financial crisis. The financial companies did have problems. They still have problems. They're laying people off. It's, it's, but those difficult moments are the time to go in as an investor. As hard as that is to do. That's right. Housing market. You predicted the housing bubble. Uh, mm -hmm. There is, has been some recovery in the housing market. You know, uh, housing permits, housing starts, right. uh, prices are up. There's a shortage of inventory in some markets. So what's your take on the housing market right now? Well, this is a very interesting question. Where is it going? In some cities, it looks like we're back to the races. Phoenix is the best example. And some California, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Las Vegas. You know, there, there are booming areas. The bigger question, though, is how long will it last? You know, bubbles do come to an end. And secondly, how pervasive is it? You know, if you're living in Detroit or St. Louis, do you think, is this relevant to me? So I, I'm, I'm careful about making any general remark, but I think that the general perception you get from reading newspaper or watching TV is a little bit too optimistic. I, I don't think that we're off to the races again in most places, and I think that there's still a risk of declines. So that's interesting because I, I know you wrote in New York Times editorial recently and it, and it was a new housing boom, don't count on it. Right. So what do you think we can count on uh, considering that's still right. the biggest investment for most <laughs> of us? Uh, that's a nice question. In finance, you should never count on any newspaper account about new boom coming. They don't mean much of anything. That's one thing I've learned. Now the housing market is a little different than the stock market because it has more momentum and once it gets going, it goes for a while, maybe another year or more, in the same direction, or it could even be longer. But don't count on it. That's absolutely the most important investment advice. Don't get carried away by some sense that everybody knows the market is going to go up. If everybody knew it was going to go up, it'd go up immediately. They, it, it's not so sure, not so secure. And at this point, I like to remember, with regard to the housing market, that something like 90% of our new mortgages are guaranteed by the government through Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or FHA. And the government is also supporting housing with a mortgage interest deduction that's under attack now and might get. So, you know, we don't know how long these supports are going to continue. We have a budget crisis. The Congress can't seem to agree on what to do. So, this is another uncertainty. From my mind, the uncertainties are very real. And I think it is not impossible that home prices five or ten years from now could be lower in real terms than they are now. Entirely possible. It's a risky investment like anyone else. But I don't mean to scare people away from taking risk. This is America. This is a country of entrepreneurs. And I think that it's, it's okay to buy a house now. Uh, mortgage rates are very low. But just don't count on it. That, that, I didn't write that. The copy editor wrote that at the newspaper. But I think it was very well chosen. Don't count on it and don't worry if you don't find it convenient to buy a house now. It's not like there's a bonanza that everyone sees and you better pile into it. So, I mean, take your time. Make sure that you get the right house. Make sure that you really want to settle down now. And if those things are, are okay, then go ahead and do it. But, but otherwise, not, don't feel compelled yeah, that you have to own your home. Don't get caught into a gold rush mentality. This, I mean, the gold rush people were disappointed too, if you remember, yes. in 1849.
<laughs> that could happen again. Bond market, you told me uh, earlier it's dangerous, you know, it looks really bad. Yeah. What's wrong with the bond market as far as you're concerned? Well, right now uh, we have negative real long rates. The inflation protected securities, uh, the tips, the, mm -hmm. the 10-year tips are negative substantially, even out to 15 years. We have negative uh, interest rates. Right, so, uh, so that they yield, rates. their yield is lower than inflation. Which means you will get less back in real terms. Right. 15 years from now than you, than you have today. You might say, well, why would anybody tie up their money for 15 years to get a guaranteed negative return? Well, it's because the, we are living in a very unusual time and a very sick economy. And people, a lot of people think, I don't know what else to do. Uh, now, I, I, I can see if you're very risk averse, putting money into tips, even at a negative rate. Uh, and there are some people who are very risk averse. But for most general investors, I think that uh, uh, I, I've actually extolled tips on this show. In the yes, past. you have. No, and, and actually it, they worked out well as an investment. But right now, in prior uh, years. they're they're yielding a negative return, and. In the, over the long run, and over the short run, it might be even more negative if interest rates go up again. Right. So, so, so now tips also have been looked as a, upon as a diversifier and as basically a non-correlated right. asset. So tips do well uh, when, you know, when the stock market doesn't do well, for instance. So right. do they have a place in your portfolio as a, you know, a diversifier uh, and, a, and a cushion right. against market declines? They're also, yeah, they are the riskless rate. Right. Uh, they are really riskless. And so uh, I have had them in my portfolio. I might even have a little left <laughs> at this point, but not much. It's not going to give you any return. So I, I think, y yes, if you're really putting money away for 15 years, then the 2028 tips are the surest way to know what you will have in 15 years. But uh, Which is gonna, it's not going to be much. much. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was an advocate for tips. I was writing papers on them back in '97 before they launched them. So I'm happy that we right. issued them, and they are very useful. But we are at the most unusual time in history where they actually have a negative return. Bond market bubble is that what we're in? That that. Yeah. Maybe, but I, I tend to think of the bond market bubble as something that's been going on for 30 years. <laughs> because way back when Paul Volcker was chairman of the Fed. The, the, 1979, the, the, I yeah, just remember, very right, right. 80. And we had double digit interest rates. And nominal interest rates have been just coming down steadily uh, for 30 years, uh, more than 30. And there's one problem, though. They can't pass zero. <laughs> you never have a negative nominal rate. And they're getting awfully close to zero. I wonder what's going to happen next. That's a good question. And, and real uh, uh, government, long term governments have been coming down too, ex post real, as you call it, which is what you really get from them. They're all, they've been trending down for decades. And now we've hit this financial crisis that uh, is causing a lot of revaluation. And now we have the Fed with. QE1, QE2, QE3, supporting long-term uh, bond prices and keeping the yields down. And they say that's temporary. Uh, so my guess is long-term, uh, it, it's not exactly a bubble, but it's an unstable situation. Uh, it doesn't make me enthusiastic about these investments at the moment. So what do we do, Bob? I, I, you're not a financial advisor, but you do invest personally. Um, yeah. And so, you know, what do we do with our bond portfolios? And, and you know, it sounds yeah. like stocks are less riskier. So what's your advice to individual investors? Yeah. What do we do in our portfolios? Yeah, it's an unusual time. In some sense, it's like the Great Depression in the 1930s when uh, interest rates were very low. Uh, the long rates weren't quite as low as they are now, but they were, it was a low interest rate environment as well. And, and, so, and, and it was a very uncertain time. Everyone was saying right. uncertainty. Uh, so what was the best thing to do? Well, it depended on the time. You know, if you, in 1933, when the Depression looked the worst, you should have gone whole hog into the stock market because it, it had a huge boom despite the Depression. So you just don't know. But m my sense is uh, that 
it, no, you can't predict the stock market. But I think that the historical evidence suggests that it looks like a better investment than the bond market. It hasn't been for the last 30 years. The bond market right. has done wonderfully. That's because of this bubble. But how long is it going to go on? So I would be inclined to tilt actually more into stocks in my portfolio, which may sound like a contradiction because I just got through saying that the, my CAPE ratio is high now. But the reason it's high is because these interest rates are so low and uh, it's not surprising. So, I, you know, I'm still thinking that a diversified portfolio that emphasizes stocks in the U.S. and in Europe too, by the way, because they're probably overreacting to their crisis and, uh, and, and then all over the world. And, uh, a diversified stock portfolio makes sense to me. You gave me a very provocative statement, I thought, and, and it was that changes in the stock markets, housing market, and the overall economy have relatively little to do with each other over years or decades. Uh, right, <laughs> I'm saying, right. okay, so what do we pay attention right. to if it's not? That's, that's what you wouldn't get by reading the newspaper. Right. They talk about confidence is back, so everything is up, the stock market, the commodity market, the housing market, but you, I know that historically they haven't been that correlated. The history is always surprising. So my thought is, let's go a little into all of those. Stocks, even real estate, and housing. Even though I've, I've expressed all these worries about these, don't let worry get away from you. And you know that one of these is likely to do well. <laughs> so to, uh, so the, the, you, you want to be as fundamentally diversified. That means internationally and across major asset classes. And that's, that's all you can do, and, and then not worry too much. And, and I know that I've, I've quoted Peter Bernstein to you before, uh, who's uh, a, a, the late, great Peter Bernstein, about the, you know, the only time you're truly diversified is when you own something you, you are really uncomfortable with. So, so is, is there uh, you know, an investment that, that you are really uncomfortable with that we should all Stay own away from? some of? No, no, no. <laughs> oh, that, that in order to be truly diversified, <laughs> that we've got to own something that we're really terrified to own? Uh, well, I'm thinking that the relatively high valuation of the stock market is not there in every sector of the stock market. So you can be reasonably diversified if you overemphasize certain sectors that are more value oriented. So uh, I would suggest buying some sector uh, ETFs that, that have a, uh, a, a low, uh, well, I would measure it by CAPE. Right, but, your uh, low CAPE ratio. Yeah, that would right. have a low price. And, and own, so, so, so what is it, if, if you were to give us one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, then what would it be? Yeah, as part of a long portfolio. Yes, uh, diversified. One, yeah, right. one example would be uh, the Spider Select Sector Financials Index, uh, right. ETF, mm -hmm. and that has a ticker of uh, XLF. Right. That, it just puts you into a broadly diversified portfolio of financial stocks. And it has a very low uh, uh, CAPE, or not very low price, uh, relative to 10-year average earnings. And now you might say, I'm afraid to do that because, hey, we just hit them with the Dodd-Frank bill, and all these regulations are coming over. Dodd-Frank said, we're going to end too big to fail. And uh, so are they pulling the rug out from under their government support? Well, they've already done that, though, and that, that's two, three years ago. Uh, you know, I don't think too big to fail is dead either. I, I hope that it, it shouldn't be a factor, but um, still probably is. So, you know, I, I'm kind of betting on history repeating itself. And it, it's been a big theme of me in my teaching at Yale, in the books I've written, that finance is a fundamental technology that drives our modern civilization. And it's not about making money. I tell my students, Going into finance is about being a productive member of society, not about getting rich. And if you get rich, you should give it away. That's what I tell them. I don't know if they'll do that. But I think finance is very important to our economy. It is beaten down right now. This is a time to go in. So as a matter of fact, you have just, you, you've written your most recent book about that is Finance and the Good Society. And in our Wealth Track Extra segment, which we're going to tape after this, which will be on our website, we will talk about finance and the good society, as a matter of fact. So, Robert Schiller, it's so great to have you here, Yale economist, uh, and just, uh, you know, economist and, and financial innovator extraordinaire. So thank you so much for being with us on Wealth Track. My pleasure.
At the conclusion of every wealth track, we give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is make sure you own some stocks. As Schiller and many of our other guests have told us, bonds have become risky after their big 30-year run-up. And this picture from Schiller adds another dimension. It compares the real total return, taking out the effects of inflation, of U.S. government bonds and U.S. stock prices. As far as inflation beating returns, preserving your purchasing power, stocks win hands down. I hope you can join us next week. We're going to talk to award-winning financial planner Harold Ivansky about how to stay solvent in retirement. Think simplify. You will really appreciate his advice. In the meantime, thank you so much for taking the time to visit with us. Have a happy Easter weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Luma Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally, and Wintergreen, your home for global value.